Good morning, and welcome to Rake's Books Live at Home. My name is Michael Barnard. I own Rake's Books in Danville, California, where it is a lovely foggy morning. And today we are excited to introduce Sarah Winman, the author of Still Life, who is here today with Sarah Blake, who is the author of some of our favorites, Postmistress and The Guest Book. And they're here to talk about Sarah's wonderful new novel, um, which has been my favorite book to sell this fall. Um, we're so thrilled to have all of you here this morning. Our run of show is going to be like this. Um, Sarah's going to talk about the book for a few minutes, and then um, Sarah will come back on screen, and they will chat for about half an hour, 40 minutes, and then I will come back and take all of your questions. So thanks for being here. Type your questions in the Ask a Question box at the bottom of the screen, and I'll see you soon. And this is Sarah Woodman. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much. And um, thank you, everyone who's tuning in. Thank you, Sarah, for, for um, agreeing to do this and for, for chatting with us um, uh, today. So uh, it's great. It's great to be here. What am I going to say about still life? Um, it's, always, it's always a problem, isn't it, when you're told to sort of describe your own book. It's, it's basically the story of Evelyn Skinner, an aging art historian and um, Ulysses Temper, so a young soldier and globe maker who meet in 1944 on a roadside in Tuscany. Um, and it's this chance encounter that will then affect their life to come. Um, and predominantly what happens in that moment and, and further on in the evening that is to come. Um, and, and about a painting that will um, instill memories for them every time they sort of see it set across four decades, is multiple characters. It goes from the Tuscan countryside to the city of Florence to, uh, uh, sorry, to the east end of London and then back to the city of Florence. Um, and the most important thing for me was that it was about found family, class and opportunity. But of course, then we go into a sort of a wider sphere with it. Then we talk about beauty, uh, the value of beauty and the importance of beauty and art um, and of course, love. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that's, that's sort of how I describe it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hi, I feel like we just got zoomed, you know, our, our screens just collided. It did. <laughs> so became a bit all, I know, I know. <laughs> Um, Sarah, it is such a treat to be uh, on the same screen as you, I have to say. Um, when Tin Man came out, it was one of those books that was being passed around, you know, and a friend said, oh my God, you have to read this. And, um, and I did. And just to fall into your world and your words are, I mean, they're just so, there's so much generosity in what you make for us. I mean, just the, the people that you create, your characters. Um, so when Michael asked me uh, if I'd like to be in conversation with you, I mean, I literally was like, yeah, <laughs> you know, just to, oh. it was great. But then, um, of course, that meant that I got to read a, a, a galley of um, still life. And um, I just, you know, it, this this word generosity keeps coming back to me in terms of what it's like to read um, read your books, but especially this one. And um, so, you know, I, I finished it just this morning, and I kind of want to, for you know, those of you who have just bought it, and and or those of you who've actually gotten to read it already this week, um, you might feel this. Um, I finished it and I had that, well, I was so moved. Mm. And that sense of being moved, of um, trans, you know, transformation and, and transport, that a big, rich novel gives. Um, mm. This book gives so much in spade, but listening to you talk about it, it seems too that that's, you know, that's very much at the heart of it. Like, what makes us us? What what moves us? What is it that shows us, you know, who we are? And often it is, you know, as this book um, does, it moves. You know, I I was thinking about, you know, it's Florence, fate, and Ian Forster. You know, the and love and art, mm -hmm. which we are at 
to, to move and, and to see ourselves, you know, in the movement. But um, so I just wanted to, to think about how full this and rich um, this is for those of you who have it up ahead. And so just to, to start, Sarah, um, I mean, I know as a writer that oftentimes um, a book begins for me um, with a scene or with a or with something, a phrase, a sentence um, that often is definitely not the beginning of the, of the book of the novel, but it is where I feel like, oh, oh, here I am. Here's the book. This is, you know, this is the kind of um, center of it. And I just thought we might just start off. I, I was wondering, <laughs> there is that place for you, you know. You know what? Someone's just knocking on the door. That's how you know it's oh, no. live. No, I've got to get rid of them. Hold on, hold on. It's so okay. exciting. <laughs> okay, so while she's away, <laughs> um, honestly, this is this this book is um, so rich and moves. It's so great. Okay. <sighs> live from London. <laughs> my neighbour. <laughs> delivering my parcel. Right. Um, I think, going back to your question, Sarah, it's a brilliant question, because I always think that when I'm reading novels. Yeah. Um, you know, you just know, and I think also, I will answer that, but I think also, you know, when an author is having fun, you know, when they're spreading their wings, when you read a book, you know, you, yeah. you, you just know that place. And so I think, you know, we mentioned a little bit earlier. So I, I start with the end. I don't start with the beginning. But I was very aware that what I wanted for this book, which is sometimes, and it was quite conscious that I wanted the tone to be joyous. Mm -hmm. And I did want this book to be entertaining because that was what I was being drawn to during the, what I would call the, the Brexit and post-Brexit years that was so politically damning and socially mm -hmm. damning this country. I needed what books can give us. Mm -hmm. You know, we know that they can make us feel less lonely and information, but I also wanted it. That glorious moment you open a book and you disappear and you're entertained and you want to hold it close and that's what I hope to recreate and so um yeah I'd probably written for about a year and then I had written this book sorry I had read this book called um Florentine Art Under Fire by an American called Frederick Hart mm -hmm. and he was during the war uh, he was in the Fifth Army. He was also an art historian. And it's his account of his wartime story. And it was quite brilliant. You know, uh, he's driving. He has a, he's in a Jeep called Lucky 13. He has a driver. They're going all over the Tuscan hillside. And the artillery is falling everywhere. And he's saying, yeah, and we thought we'd stop for lunch. I mean, that in itself is just beautiful. <laughs> so, OK, they're going to stop for lunch. So they drive on and they come to this albergo. And they stop and he says there are some French captains there having lunch and there were some uh, uh, Italian cust custodians and there were a couple of English spinsters and the bombs are falling and then he moved. And I go, no, no, wait, wait, wait. What do you mean English spinsters having lunch in war-torn Tuscany? And that was the moment where I thought, ooh, I think I have my beginning mm -hmm. because the image was just so incongruous but still, you know, our idea of wartime naturally is so horrific, or certainly if we go back to the Second World War. And yet, within the arena of war, there was still time to have lunch. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I thought, I'm going to have those two spinsters. And I'm going to use the word spinster, which is absolutely not a word I would normally use. But I thought, OK, I can keep them there. I can have them. Um, another important two words that, that helped me with the tone was reduced menu. Um, which was really important, obviously, because food was not easily accessible to uh, in some of these places because of war. But but that was it. And I thought, well, who are these spinsters? And I just thought, well, they've got to be ex-lovers, haven't they? You know, because suddenly the, you get into that you get into that gaze, that ex-lover kind of gaze, where everything else is superfluous. You're back in that you're back in that place where you split up. And the rancor is still there. And, and so that, I would say, really started to help me with, with what the tone was going to be as we went forward with the book. Hmm. Could you just read that first sentence just for everybody so we can hear it in your voice? 
or even that first yeah. paragraph. It's just, it's such yeah, a great, definitely. such a great way in. Somewhere in the Tuscan hills, two English spinsters, Evelyn Skinner and a Margaret someone, were eating a late lunch on the terrace of a modest albergo. It was the 2nd of August, a beautiful summer's day, if only you could forget there was a war on. One sat in shade, the other in light, due to the angle of the sun and the vine-strewn trellis overhead. They were served a reduced menu, but celebrated the Allied advance with large glasses of Chianti. Overhead, a low-flying bomber cast them momentarily in shadow. They picked up their binoculars and studied the markings. Hours, they said and waved. Oh, this rabbit's delicious, said Evelyn, and she caught the eye of the proprietor, who was smoking by the doorway. She said, Cornelio, buonissimo, signore. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like one of the things that's so, um, I mean, everything, as you say, the, the tone, and also one of the things I, I would love you to, to talk about a little bit is how you move through this novel, how you move from character to character. It's very sneaky. The, the, um, and it, you're, you're moving from, you know, this very specific moment at a, you know, at a table, and then you pull up, and um, we, know, we know that it's war, um, and then even bigger, you know, who's at the table and, and who's above, who's above in the sky. And I'm, I'm just wondering, um, about the way in which you kind of moved into how you wanted to tell the story, how, um, because it moves, as you say, from this is the moment in 1944, um, and it moves in sections to 1979, mm -hmm. and moves through a, a, a cast of characters between them, Evelyn, who we just meet there, and then Ulysses, the, the soldier that will come up above. I'm, I'm just um, thinking about uh, like how it is that you wanted, how, how, you, how you came about telling this story and, 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 how, and the sort of um, many rooms that you open. Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, I never know how I'm going to write, so I don't plot mm -hmm. anything. So it's a big mm -hmm. jumping in. But what I'm always aware of are influences. Uh -huh. So I absolutely trust that creative nudge. And I trust books that, that really get under my skin. And there were two books, well, one particular book that got under my skin. And I can always remember, years ago I read it. It's an Australian book called Cloud Street by Tim Winton. Mm. And it's a very ensemble piece. They're very theatrical in many ways. So a lot of, a lot of dialogue. And, and it's about two families and they inhabit, um, they end up living in a house together. So multiple characters. And I just remember reading it and thinking, oh my God, it really works. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the through line is still there and you still know who the main characters are. Mm -hmm. But we get glimpses of these other lives because, of course, if you have main characters, they're still going to appear differently. Mm -hmm in the lives of others it's very important you know that's why they're there because each person you come in contact will almost have a different version of you or will shine the light on certain aspects but, of yourself absolutely and i think one of the things that i was thinking about so um maybe we could talk a little bit about the way in which um you know you have evelyn skinner and you know her it, basically the novel spans her life from, you know, to, from when she's 21 um, in 1901 to 1979. So it's these 99 years. So thinking about the fact, and, and through Evelyn Skinner, who at one point says to um, another character, what I want to do, I'm, I'm, I'm a mediocre artist, but I want to be a memorable teacher. Mm. And um, I think this, this notion of, um, to see not only um, what art might do, but what life might be and what love might look like mm -hmm. through this single character and through this, this woman who mm -hmm. um, at this point in 1944, she's in her, 40, no, she's in her 60s, right? At yeah. this point, yeah. And um, 
So she she's in her 60s, but um, Ulysses is in his 20s when she mm. meets him. And the, the, I guess maybe if you could talk a little bit about uh, Evelyn Skinner and, and who she is in the book, how she works and, and how she is this, um, she is this kind of figure that both teaches that also in her living gives us, you know, just so much. So she is, she's, she's a progressive independent woman. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's important to say that she has independent means as well, because yes. yeah. there is that adds to the confidence. I've met these women. Yeah. They don't really worry about money too much. You know, it's a very different confidence. And I think that is in juxtaposition to Ulysses, who is sort of a working class lad of mm -hmm. that period. So she does have independent means. And she, you know, she has a, a mother who as Italian and by all accounts pretty religious and a father who was a bohemian artist. And, and that is the path that she travels. But she was also, I wanted her to be, not quite the foil, but I wanted her to, to, to carry a flag in opposition to, to Forster, Ian Forster. That's what she's there yeah. for, yeah. you know, and that's really important. So I love Forster and I love, his writing and and I think he was incredibly ahead of his time and a modern writer and um, I, I will veer off from the question slightly but but okay. I came to a room, with, a room with a view as a film all those years ago before I read the book and they're both very different things yeah the film is very centered on the love story for those who don't know and the book is very much about class and about yeah. art as well as love so it's a much much darker story and then I started to you know of course, I would I would sort of think about those two uh, elements, the film and the book, because anyone even thinking about writing about Florence, these things would would flash in. Or everyone who's gone before, you can't help but but be overshadowed by to some degree. And then I was just reading more about Forster because he did stay in this pensione that was run by a Cockney landlady. Mm -hmm. It's real. It's called the Pensione Simi. And he was on a year long holiday with his mother. They had this very, very, I know, very close relationship. And he was gay. And he didn't, he didn't have a relationship until he was 37 or he didn't have a sexual relationship until he was 37. And that would have been about 1915, 1916. And he wrote Maurice before that. So his mm -hmm. one gay novel, Mm -hmm. He wrote before he'd even had a sexual encounter with another man. And, and it's so confused, you know, that, that's, to, to have that life, because of course, for those who aren't aware, you know, homosexuality is illegal up until sort of 1967 in my country. Yes. And, and it was only partially. So he wasn't free really to write the book that he wanted to write. Mm -hmm. And and although there's this sort of queer sensibility that runs through his books, he didn't really write it. And I thought, well, what if he meets somebody? What if he meets, what if I put them in the same room and all the good bits or some of the good bits that he went on to write in a room with a view came mm -hmm. from Evelyn. So mm -hmm. Evelyn Skinner actually is this gay woman who is a celebration of all that Forster can't be. Yeah. And that was really about my celebration of myself and my freedom as a gay writer mm -hmm. you know, because we take it for granted there's still 71 countries where homosexuality and being gay is illegal 11 of those that you will be put to death and we forget that we always talk mm -hmm. about often, where we're sitting the freedom of our lives and all of this yeah we're lucky but it's still not it's not for everyone mm -hmm. and then for you know he, he stopped writing fiction after um passage to india and you just wonder, you know, what could there have been other books? And he died in mm -hmm. sort of 1970. And he's, he's so significant because so many of his books are about interconnectedness. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and that's also, it's not just connecting with somebody else, but it's connecting with the light and dark within himself. Yeah. And that, is, that comes up in A Room with a View. And so that's really, I wanted Evelyn to be, everything visibly and open that he couldn't be. And I know mm -hmm. this is a woman who has led this life 
of privilege. But at some point we know, we don't know at what point it happens, but at some point we know that that has flipped and that she understands her privilege in the way that I think wealth should understand its privilege and its possibility. She says, you know, one of the things of being, you know, of, of being in this position is to raise others up. Mm -hmm. You know, so she's, I think she's a remarkable, I loved writing Evelyn. And I think yeah. she's a remarkable, and I have met women like that, you know, who've chosen a path um, of not having a family and that they've put their, their mothering into the mothering of, of friends or acquaintances or, or people who need that at the time. And I think it's incredibly powerful and I think it's incredibly valuable. Yeah, and, and um, I mean, one of the, you were speaking about joy, that you wanted to write a, a, a novel full of joyousness. And I think that, I mean, Evelyn Skinner, um, the, ways in, the way in which she is so fully, once she's in Florence, I mean, the, for those of you who haven't read it yet, the, the novel ends with this really just unbelievable bit um, of <clears throat> writing that's about Evelyn's Two weeks, her first her first encounter with Florence, where she becomes, as she says herself, and um, and the way in which art, absolutely, are um, you know, are, are, are one of the influences is one of the influences on her, but also just um, the street and the light and the sense that any corner around any corner, my sort of um, moment that will, that she will know means that she's alive. <clears throat> and the fact that she pulls all those moments and that, you know, that Sarah actually gives us the, the sort of the young Evelyn, like at, we, we watch her becoming in the, at the very end of the, of the novel and, and then understand then how she spends the, earliest part of the novel, giving that to us. I mean, having given it to Ulysses, the, and I definitely want to talk about Ulysses and his idea of home and the warrior, but mm -hmm. um, to all this, to, to the sort of, um, as you say, the found family that the novel mm -hmm. creates, but it's Evelyn's um, experience of, of um, art and of place um, that perhaps only can happen when you're out of home, um, I know I'm I'm doing like 65 different <laughs> thoughts, but I also really want to talk about this tradition of writing novels about the idyll, and in particular the sort of Italian idyll, you know, where you go elsewhere in order to connect. I mean, it's it's yeah. just, it's an odd paradox. So maybe I mean, there's about 90 questions in there, so <laughs> it's like start wherever you. Oh, want. I but. I think it's absolutely true. I think, and I think also, if we just concentrate on um, just a moment for Evelyn, or you know, and take her as as a gay person in in England in 1901, she would have gone somewhere else. A lot of gay people went somewhere else in order to find themselves. You know, it was very important. You know, in my early years, I loved to get away from this country. And then if we extended it, that, that it becomes more about, you know, the Bohemians in this country left this country and went mm -hmm. to Italy. Mm -hmm. They found there was, they actually did, they, 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 there was a sense of sexual freedom a, away from the conventions of this country. There was, of course, the weather. There was, of course, their yeah. money went further. Right. And they were also influenced by the literature that had gone before. Mm -hmm. You know, that always happened with Italy. You know, that the people have always talked about the art mm -hmm. and the beauty. And if we talk about Florence, that it, it, strangely, it's not my favorite city in Italy, but there is something about it that there is, there is a harmony and perfection about it mm -hmm. that, that you can't really describe, but it goes in the eye and it, mm -hmm. and it settles in the heart. And I think it is about that word harmony that, that in that period of time, if we're going into the 14th, 15th, 16th century, and the architecture, that perspective composition was arranged around the human figure, not only yeah. in painting, but also in architecture. You know, the circle and the triangle and the square, mm -hmm. that is what it was all based on. You look at these paintings and, and people have written books on, on sort of the geometry of the lines of people, and that translates to the city itself. Mm -hmm. You know, in those early years, you know, 
they didn't put a, anything, they didn't put a foot wrong in how the light court, what was the color they were using? They were using the ochre. How that court is setting sun. I mean, it's all there for harmony. And, and it's often been known and, and written about as a knowable city. And a knowable mm -hmm. city means that you start to get to know yourself within mm -hmm. that um, mm -hmm. place. And, and that's why the poets went, you know, because there's poetry there. Mm -hmm. And it's quite interesting. So when Napoleon left, I don't know, in the early 19th century, left Florence, being defeated, it o Florence opened up again, or Italy mm -hmm. opened up. Basically. So you had Keats and you had Shelley and you had Byron and you had Robert Browning and you had Elizabeth Barrett Browning. They all went there because they'd all talked about it. Mm -hmm. So they were all influencing each other, going, you've got to go. That's what they were saying. You've got to go to Italy. You've got to go to Florence. And there was, a, there was a French writer called Madame de Stahl, and she wrote a book in 1807, and I didn't read yeah. this one, um, called Corinne on Italy, or Litaly. Mm -hmm. And it was translated into English um, in 1810. And apparently Mary Shelley read it so many times. Uh -huh. And Elizabeth Bar Browning read it so many times. And it mm -hmm. became this sort of unofficial travel guide yeah. for, for women. and. Uh, because it's also about a woman's creativity abroad. Yeah, yeah. But so that's, you know, you're talking two and a half, two centuries ago, but people were still behaving in the same way that we are. You're listening right. out to where the place to go, you know, what is it going to influence me creatively? So mm -hmm. I think I think that is that is the search of the idiot. It's the search for that little thing that ignites the soul and ignites the joy yeah. and ignites the creativity that allows you to paint or or draw or sculpt or, you know, transcend what is the everyday at times. And at the same time though, the um, transcend, but only because you really fully see the everyday. I mean, yeah. I think this is one of the, the great paradoxes, both of the idyll, but also of what art can do. I mean, great art. And, and you know, I can't remember which character talks about the fact that nurture the body that you, the soul will follow you know yeah. first it might have been Constance early this made yeah. up is she a made up poet the um, he's a made up poet that yeah uh, in Florence that is an early yeah but you know just that sense of um I mean one one of the great joys of this book um is that you get so much good food just from reading you know like at one point I was like oh my god this is like a perfect recipe for carbonara that we've got. It is here. actually a perfect you know, recipe. It was, yes. you know, but it, it was, it's great. And that's, you know, so, so again, there's that, the sense of you have characters who are, who are, you know, coming to a place in order to talk about art and experience art, really talking about, um, you know, that this, this, this is better coffee on this square than on that square, which is always what goes on, you know, like, where's the best, you know, carbonara or the best cacio e pepe or anything like that. But let's, one of the things, let's, let's bring us, so Evelyn is this kind of I and, and this, this great teacher, but Ulysses, who is mm -hmm. the, the, the warrior who, um, you know, spends, um, he comes home from the war, um, from Italy, from and and from this chance encounter, and um, he's very much the center of of the book, and and yet, in in many ways, he's the least of, of of them all. And um, sorry, I missed really, that. He's the, he's the he's he's sort of the least knowable. Um, oh, I mean, yeah. you know, he he is i mean maybe let's just talk about ulysses and the fact that his last name is temper and so mm -hmm. oftentimes through the book though people call him temp for short so you have this you know the word for time i mean mm -hmm. he, he is this figure um that gathers uh people and is always talking about home and where is home and um i mean he's the one who brings us to florence actually really but maybe um, talk a little bit about him and and what's what sort of who why he is to you. Sorry, I missed that part. What what, what he is to me? What he why is he so vital? Like just talk about if you could just talk yeah. a little bit about him. I mean, he's the other major 
character. He is the other major. Um, yeah, I mean, he developed. I wasn't quite sure. He, he developed in the sense that I was bringing a young man home from war. Right. You know, and that you can't have anybody unscathed. So there would always be there would always be a, a wound there of some sort. Mm -hmm. And I knew that would be there. And, and the rest sort of led out from from that point. I think there's a selflessness to him. Mm -hmm. And I think there's such a gentleness to him and a generosity of him. Mm -hmm. And um, and the space that he inhabits isn't a very common space really for men to inhabit. And I've done this with Cressy as well. I've given them, they, rep, they, they inhabit a feminine space in many ways. Yeah, and yeah. And the energy that runs through them is, 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 there's got a good chunk of feminine energy and that was done on purpose. Mm -hmm. um, that I wanted the two sort of main men to be the good men and what women need to be equal and successful in their lives. Mm -hmm. Because women will need good men on their side for things to change and for things to happen because we've done it, you know, we shouted about it so much by ourselves that we need the other half of the population to jump on board with us. Mm -hmm. But that, that has to have an understanding of why. And I think this is what Ulysses does. He has this innate understanding of, of women's needs in a way. His ego is, 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 is veil-like, it's a very fluid. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think, you know, I think that's what I wanted. I wanted him to sort of represent so that, you know, when Peg is having trouble being a mother or he didn't, or she didn't want to be a mother, that he, that he can step in. Mm -hmm. That you've got these two men, you know, bringing up the child, you know, and they, they are, they're mothering. Mm -hmm. rather than focus being on motherhood for for the woman that there is something else going on that Ulysses is very much there um, as a support for other people's needs and desires and he's sort of he's a good listener and all of these traits one would usually associate sort of with women yeah and that is the sort of beauty that he he straddles these two worlds very much you know a sort of a light and dark and and I think that is you know that's what I wanted him to sort of represent you know good men and and their importance in our world in our mm -hmm. female world as well mm -hmm. utterly important and 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 to, to give him a really good break you know let's give him something Give him something good. What and what could he? Because out of all of them, he would be the only one who would know what to do with the opportunity that has just been handed to him. Yeah. And I think one of the things that was that is telling when he first arrives, you know, he says, you know, how, he was sitting there outside the cafe, wondering how he could make another man's life his own. Mm -hmm. And that's how it starts. They all, they both, you know, the characters who end up in Italy. It's almost like they're imitating somebody else's mm -hmm. life oh my goodness until they realize actually it's pretty much the same life that they had at home because that's what we do we recreate mm -hmm. it we had mm -hmm. rituals at home we recreate them where they go and then they do they start to expand and they start to just ease into it and they do start to understand where they can get the a better coffee from yeah kind of an anchoring into this other way of life that then, again, you know, allows other people to experience it through his generosity, that he does yeah. want other people to come and join him and be part yeah. of that and share in that. Yeah. I mean, it's, and I'm listening to you and thinking about, you know, the fact that Ulysses, the wanderer, is the one in this novel who creates a world. I mean, he is the one who makes the world. He's also um, the uh, maker of globes. And um, there's so many, I mean, there's so many just beautiful moments in here of, um, of makers, of, you know, the artists at work. And, um, and so you have Ulysses making these globes out of uh, this, you know, Australian um, plastic, I mean, sort of magnate. And I mean, there just, there is this kind of, um, 
this sort of kaleidoscope of coincidences and also just of, of good fortune. When I asked you before about thinking about how this novel moved, I mean, when in my margins in the beginning, I was writing like, you know, this is working the way that fairy tales work, you know, mm. just like, and, you know, and then as luck would have it, and then something happens, you know, that yeah. the, 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 um, there is a kind of um, innocence about the way this book moves. And in, in, in many ways, it is the it is the innocence of of um, of Ulysses, who is a character of wonder. He yeah. he is taught um, when he, he runs into the 60 year old Evelyn Skinner in 1944, just after this scene that you you started. And he has shown a painting that he has, that, you know, that sort of changes everything. And um, that that sense of of wonder as a way to move forward. And and I'm thinking about, you know, again, this that the men um, that you give Cressy and and Ulysses this kind of feminine uh, that often isn't associated with, you know, a kind of male. That certainly the warrior, certainly the one who's going to plant his oar, and you know, and get yeah. to, to the place. It's like he just he one thing leads to another you know, in in this mm -hmm. book. That that's so lovely. I'm I'm also just very. I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about the various kinds of love that are in this this book and how um just how you the the relation between love and life and art that that you're that you're clearly centering on um well that's a very big question um the different kinds of love well yeah i mean to, there is there's 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 sexual love and there's friendship love and there's familial love found family love there's there's love between you know a child and and her guardian um but again, it's, it, you know, I didn't start with that. It was, as you were talking before about this sort of fairy tale aspect of the book, I really just didn't want anything bad, anything else bad uh -huh. to happen to, you mm -hmm. know? And that was quite conscious. It's not that, that I can't write it. It's not that I can't write hard edges and, right. you know, ability. That was the pact that I had right at the start, joy and entertainment. And so sometimes as you point out, oh, and luck would have it, something like that, this happened. It's done a little bit tongue in cheek in the sense, yeah, yeah. oh yeah, now we're moving on with this. Yeah. And, you know, and, and I think, you know, I was following an, an art historian around in, in Florence for two years who I met, a chance encounter. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and she said, you know, be beautiful art uh, opens our eyes to the beauty of the world. That was one of the things she said, oh, beautiful art opens our eyes to the beauty of the world. And she was so lovely. And she had this most incredible mind when she was talking about art. But at the same time, she talked about nature in a very different way. Mm -hmm. And so she would say, if I was talking about art, my mind gets taxed because I'm talking about the provenance and I'm talking about the brush strokes and I'm talking about this. And she said, but it's so much simpler than that, Sarah. It's how it moves you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, that's the resonance of it. What do you feel? It doesn't matter what somebody tells you you should feel. I mean, you can, and you can maybe expand your interest, but it's what, what you feel like when you stand in front of a painting. Is there anything that catches your eye? Is there any feeling that you go through? Are you moved in a way? And all of these adjectives, or you know, I'm talking about, is love. I think we get so centered on the word, and certainly when, when I was younger, that love is who am I attracted to? Who is attracted to me? That kind of stuff. And then mm -hmm. you, you just get older and, and the whole word expands into dignity and grace and empathy and compassion and wonderment and, and generosity. Those mm -hmm. words are all encapsulated mm -hmm. in love. And that's what this book is. It's mm -hmm. it's a loving book mm -hmm. of what human beings are and can be. 
it is our potential and is our aspiration because your country as well as mine has gone through this incredible shift in the last five years. And something has happened whereby the anti of what I'm talking about has been celebrated. Well, yeah. that's not my, that's the, how I don't see it. And so as an act of resistance, I'm writing a book to say, yeah, and there's also this. Yeah. Because we're being so manipulated to only feel fear and rage and anger at others. And that makes up a very dissipated society that can't bind together. And I'm saying, no, no, when we use words of compassion and empathy and, and all these good things, tolerance and love and, you know, enoughness, then that's an incredible force. Yeah. And that's what I've written about, that you have this group of people who keep expanding. And just from the very nature of how they are, there's a grumpy Contessa downstairs who does not want anything to do with them. But by the end of the book, she does. She doesn't want to leave them because of, of it's, it's so attractive. It's so alluring when somebody is in love, whatever that space is. We've all felt it. You know, that person who just radiates something. And you think, I think I just want to sit here for a moment and be in there all. And often that, I've often found that with older people in my life, that we don't have to talk, we just sit there. And, and, you know, that is also what good art is about. How it makes you feel. You know, good theatre is about that. I saw something recently where it just reached into my guts mm -hmm. and reminded me that I'm a human being capable of immense loving. And that, to me, is what literature and, you know, books, sorry, yeah, literature and, and, and theatre and art um, and dance, or, you know, all of, the, all of the arts, it's what it's about. It's just stopping us, taking us and making us sit in the moment and reminding us, you know, that we're also capable of something incredibly rich. Well, thank you. That was a that was terrific great. way of starting the day. Um, so I have a couple questions from the audience, and hopefully there will be more uh, as we go on. But um, first one is from Sally. Um, could you talk a little bit about art historian Stella Rudolph and how she intersected with your journey writing this book? No, oh, I'm so glad Stella, um, Sally asked that. Hi, Sally. Hi, Sally. Um, so yes, my chance encounter. I was at, um, I was having acupuncture. I'm going to try and make this story short, but I was having acupuncture and uh, the acupuncturist was Italian and she knew that I was writing a book and she said, so, so how are you going? I went, awful, absolutely awful. My main protagonist is an art historian and I know nothing about art history. I said, I don't know why I, don't know why I started it, don't know what I'm doing, blah, blah, blah. And she said, if you could have anything, what would you have? And I said, well, Funny you should say that. I know exactly who I want. I want somebody who went during the flood. I want her Anglo-English. I would like her to still be there, uh, basically, who never left and who's still practicing art history. And she goes, OK, hold on. So she's putting the needles in and she gets on her phone. And then we hear, bing, and she goes, ah, OK. Put a few more needles in, bing. And I go, what? And she goes, you'll get an email tonight. I went, oh, OK. And that night, I got an email from somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody who said, we found somebody for you. She's an art historian in her 70s. She went to Florence during the flood and she never left. And she's waiting for you. And I was flying to Florence the next day. And she lived in this, she lived in this old palazzo in San Nicolo. We sat in her studio and the terracotta floor still had the residue of the, um, of the minerals after the flood. And it was surrounded by books and masterpieces. And, and I took her loads of wine because I really wanted her to like me. And um, <laughs> it's loads. And I, took the, I didn't even take the bottle that she really liked. She loved, I love a Rosato Frizzante, which is a, it was a fizzy rosé. And I didn't take that. I didn't even cross my mind to. Anyway, and I went back and I kept seeing her. And she was so remarkable. She, uh, she, was, she was known and famous for a particular Baroque, as she called him, 
artist called Carlo Maratti, and she'd written lots of papers and lots of monographs, and she was writing this, this great one. And she thought I was an art historian student. She used to send me off to these obscure churches, and I only wanted to follow her around. And I couldn't find the question that would unlock her because she was incredibly academic, and that wasn't going to work for this book. And then I, had, I just had to just say to her, I said, look, Stella, I just want to ask you one thing. She goes, what, what, my dear, what? And I said, what did you think of Michelangelo? And she looked aghast and she thought, as if it was the worst question anyone could ever <laughs> ask her. It was so basic. And then she went, oh, he was an earthquake. And it was like, I suddenly unlocked her. I knew what to ask her. I knew how to talk to her because only somebody, I've never heard him described like that, only somebody with all this, these years and, and knowledge could just have a little turn of phrase about all of these artists and, and an accessible turn of phrase. And so I followed her for those two years and we were just, and she always used to hide a cigarette from me and I loved the fact that she still smoked and, you know, she was remarkable. And, um, and, and she, uh, yeah, she, she died in May 2020. Um, so we were on the phone a lot and then, and then just as she came into my life, so she disappeared from my life. She was remarkable. And it wouldn't, and I have to categorically say that Evelyn would not have been Evelyn without her. Um, so she gave me so, so much. So you said you're not an art historian. Did you come to a greater appreciation of, of art through writing the novel? I did, you know, my, my, my idea of art was probably like, you know, I've been to a lot of galleries and I sort of know what I like. And I think, I think it just did. I, I, I think I absorbed far more than I would tell people that I did, you know, um, when I've talked to people about when they've gone to Florence or I've met them in Florence and I talk about the city or I talk about certain art uh, works, I do hear her voice. Um, and so I probably have. I think the appreciation will always come back to what it does to you. I think it's, I think it's, I think it's very, it's overtalked. And I've always thought a lot of art is overtalked, and and I don't think anybody should ever feel diminished that they don't have the knowledge, or the so-called secret of what's behind a painting. If you are interested and you want to look it up, there's many things online, but I still think the thing that is mostly valid is what is your relationship in that moment to what you're seeing. And if, you know, I'm sure there's not, but if anybody does feel nervous about going to art galleries because of that, just cross, cross, cross the threshold. You just have a little experiment, just stand in front of one or two things and see if anything <laughs> moves you. Um, but as, as Stella said, art history is just the history told through art. And I think that breaks it down in a way. It's it's that's what it is, you know, and and I think it's it's a simple way of you know seeing what sometimes what was happening in society at that point. What were the artists going through? What were they wanting to convey? You know, the Renaissance was amazing because it was you know suddenly they were having they were being given permission to move away from from a kind of a very, very uh, limited Christian view and have been given permission to paint classical stories as well and sculpt classical stories. And for an artist, that was incredible, you know, to have that sort of freedom. And, and, and it was, I mean, it was short lived in many respects, but she said, you know, start to see what wasn't there maybe a century ago. And then you'll get a little bit of a clue maybe as to what was happening in society. You know, that sort of concertina effect of, of an open society and then it sort of closes down and, you know, that, that kind of stuff. So it's quite basic, but, but sort of quite fascinating to sort of try it out. Absolutely. Um, so in some ways, this is a question for, for you, Sarah, but I think for both of you, um, mm -hmm. you spoke of the female side of the male characters. Um, and then you have the character Peg, who is so strong, but held back by the times in which she lived. 
And I think that that you, Sarah, also in the guest book have a character or two who's sort of not a smooth fit with the time. How does that work for you? Yes, yeah, Sarah. Uh, Either of you can go first. Okay, I didn't quite. I you, I sort of you dropped out. My Was I cutting out? I'm sorry. Um, yeah. So the question that Lucy asks. Um, you talk about the female side of the male characters, but then you have the character of Peg, who's so strong and held back by the times in which she lived. And it seems to me that both of you have a character like right. that. Um, and maybe talk about that a little bit. Sarah, go ahead. I, I mean, yes. I mean, that, that whole idea of women not being able to reach their potential um, runs through the book you know, runs through the book from, from female artists who have been totally overlooked to the career that was opened for a woman in Florence, um, which was a nun. And then women um, not having the freedom to not be mother, to be mothers, yeah. you know, and that's, I think that's really important. And so I'm, I'm wanting to write about women who, who make that choice actually and are supported. In this book, it was a bit being supported in making that choice, you know, and I think I just felt that's very, very important that there is still, you know, there's a difference between motherhood and mothering. And it doesn't mean that you're not capable of mothering in some way. And that's why the men step in. And, and that's why Evelyn steps in, a woman who hasn't mm -hmm. had children. And, and this is it's about helping Peg out. It's about helping Peg reach her potential. And her potential mm -hmm. doesn't be about motherhood. It is for some people. And there's a lot of women there who that's, that's what, you know, the, that, that's given meaning. But it's also, it's something so soulful. You know, I can't even put words to it. But there are also other women, you know, who haven't wanted to be mothers, myself included, you know. And I want to put forward, and I want to tell the stories of, of many older women in my life who've gone down that path. Yeah. But the value of that is still so intrinsic, you know, and there's still a wholeness to that. Um, so I'll leave it there. Sarah, yes, you. Well, I mean, one of the things I was thinking so much is that um, there's, you know, there's the sort of possible pathways that are available at, at, in certain times. And one of the things that I love in um, Still Life is that Evelyn, well, I guess it's Constance says to Evelyn and then Evelyn says to Alice, who's the, you know, the younger generation that for the woman artist, there were two choices. There was the convent or marriage. And, um, and at one point, uh, Evelyn calls out to Alice, age nine, I think, or 10, you know, when she first meets and says, you know, uh, convent or, you know, or marriage. And, and this little girl shouts that convent, you know, of course. And, and then one of the things that I think is um, so important for women um, as they um, grow to themselves, as they are, are um, is, is the um, older woman or other, or, you know, a, a, another path like that's given and that is, it's not only, and it's shouted out, like, you can do this, you can, there are these other um, roles. I mean, you're talking about mothering and, and motherhood, but you know, there's, you know, what does it look like to be a woman in the world, in the world, and you want to be a woman artist? And if there are no, um, I mean, the still life deals with this, oh, no, that there were women artists, how would you even start to be able to imagine yourself forward? And I think, you know, for me, certainly in the guest book, it's like, you know, one of the tragedies for um, Joan, who's a central character, but also for Moss, who's a um, undeclared gay man in the, in, you know, the bulk of, or a lot of the novel takes place in 1959. You know, that sense of without um, the sort of possible path shown to you, or even, you know, imagined aloud for you, it's very hard to break out of, you know, the sort of self-constructed um, roles. And, you know, so often women certainly would end up in, in marriage and motherhood. That's the, I mean, you know, reader, I married him. That's where the story ends. 
but to have these other characters in your life and or in a book or in a painting um, or on a wall of a museum that they, that's a woman that was made by a woman look at how she sees differently and I think this is you know, this is the, the great thing about um, what art can also do, but also, you know, what women do for each other. Yeah. Yeah, very well said. Um, and we have time for maybe two more, so I'm going to ask them both at once. Um, is this your favorite book you've written? Um, and if not, which <laughs> is? And then is there an Italian translation scheduled? Uh, I've got one customer who's in Italy and, um, and has a book group there composed exclusively of Italian readers? Um, no, they're, they're, Italian translation rights have not um, been granted or been asked for at all. I'm not sure if it will. I, it's a funny one. I suppose it's not about Italians. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's, I don't know. Maybe it will come. But I think also it's, you know, we talked, it's a big book. I think sometimes that's, that can be tricky. Um, and it's my favorite book. Yeah, you know what? It was, I think it was, it has been my favorite book because it, it sort of reinstated the joy of writing. So I really like, enjoyed, I remember enjoying, and I would just say now when I'm talking about the joy of writing, yeah, it's still miserable at times. You know, there's, <laughs> still, there's still loads of doubt and fear, but I know I connected to this real joyful energy. And I think I did have that with my first book because, of course, you know, you, you don't know what's to come. So you do sort of tend to have a lot of joy. And then and then as creativity meets business, which is publishing, you know, I think I think I was I was aware of other things. I enjoyed writing those other books. But I think I think this being my fourth book, I could could sort of spread my wings and kind of do what I wanted with it. I felt there were times when I was writing it and I could just go, I can write anything I want right now, anything I want, you know, and you can't always do that. Of course you can't, you know, you've still got to hold the reins of a story, but I do believe that there were moments and that that was just to have that expansiveness was really thrilling at times. So yeah, I would, I would think this one maybe. But I also, you know, I love Tin Man for a very personal reason. So, you know, very different books. All right. I hate to cut this off, but um, thank you both so much. Um, I have one quick commercial announcement, everybody. Um, watching Tuesday morning at 11 o'clock our time, um, we are helping launch uh, Ken Follett's new novel, Never, um, and he will be joined in conversation by the Right Honorable Catherine Ashton, Baroness of Holland, um, former High Commissioner to the um, European Communities Security Council. So that should be very exciting. Tickets are on the website. Thank you again so much. Um, I, as I said at the beginning, I just love this book so much, and it's a pleasure to be um, the store launching it in the U.S. And thank you, Sarah, for for joining us today. Thank you, Sarah. It's nice to see both you. of you again. And I hope we will Thank see you, you in the store sometime soon. I'd love that. Thank you, Sarah. It's Thank lovely you. meeting you. Lovely meeting Thank you, Sarah. Bye-bye, Michael. Yeah. Bye, guys. Thank you, everybody. Bye, guys. Thanks.